Over time, different styles of boats have been used on the Great Kanawha. An early frontier enterprise was boat building at Kelly Station near Witcher Creek. They actually had a boat yard that built flatboats. So as those uh, immigrants would come across the Appalachian chain and down into the valley by way of the Gauley River or the New River, they would stop at Kelly Station, which is very close to the headwaters of the Great Canal, build a flatboat, float down the river. Indians use canoes, either a form called a dugout, which is a hollowed out tree trunk, or a bark canoe, typically with a frame of white cedar and a covering of birch bark. A 10-man canoe could be built within half a day. And um, this was a very efficient way of traveling, moving people and moving goods uh, during the historic period and probably went back to the prehistoric periods also. When the Europeans came in and began to develop trades, commerce on the river, they began to realize they had to do it on a larger scale. And to do this, they created primarily two ways of doing it. If you were a farmer, if you were a person who didn't normally work the river beyond the river, you created a flatboat, which was nothing more than a rectangular box made watertight, and you loaded it with an abundance of whatever you had and floated it down river with using large sweeps or paddles to control and maintain the boat as you went downstream. But it was strictly a downstream boat. Once it reached its destination, they unloaded the product on board, and then they would disassemble the boat. And they used that disassembled lumber, rough cut lumber, for building homes and barns and all kind of things. As people began to want to carry things back upstream, it became far more challenged to them. And to do this, they came up with a boat they called the kill boat. It was an unusual boat in many, many ways. It was built to carry passengers and freight. It was a, a, a long, almost canoe-shaped boat, but with a deeper keel on it. Now keep in mind, there was no mechanical means to propel the boat at that point. So men, very strong, healthy young men, would use 12-foot pike poles with a steel tip on it to literally push the boat back upstream. To do this, they walked along the gunnels of the boat and set these pike poles in the river and pushed. They also had a method where they would take a line, a rope, and carry from the head of the boat out to a tree and they would wrap the line around the tree and pull on it. And they called this cordelling the boat upstream. So this was an, an immensely hard task for those people who were doing this. To do this meant that they spent hours pushing this pike pole, pushing this back upstream. They also were the ones who helped create this word of bushwhacking because they would get close to the bank and they would grab tree branches and literally pull the boat up by holding onto tree branches. For about 15 years, the keel boat was the preferred method for shipping salt and other products downriver. It carried salt down to Cincinnati, which at that point was actually known as Porkopolis because they were killing pigs and, and saving and storing and uh, curing the salt pork that was used all over the nation at that point. But they also shipped great amounts of salt to places like Nashville and on downstream to Memphis. While the keel boat was an innovation, it gave way to one of the most popular boats in American history, the Western River Steamboat. On October 20th, 1811, the steamboat New Orleans, designed by Robert Fulton and Robert Livingston, left Pittsburgh for the first steam-powered attempt to navigate the Mississippi to the port of New Orleans. It was a large boat for its day, 148 feet long and weighing 371 tons. And it had an altogether eventful journey experiencing a major earthquake on its way. On January the 12th, 1812, the New Orleans reached its destination and soon began regular service between New Orleans and Natchez, Mississippi. Two years later, she hit a stump and sank, but the New Orleans and succeeding steamboats heralded the era of steam power. It set in motion the building of hundreds and then thousands of American Western River steamboats, a uniquely American vessel. 
Nowhere else in the world will you find anything like the Western River Steamboat. Early steamboats were made of wood, ranged in length from 80 to 140 feet. They were 10 to 20 feet wide. Early fuel was wood, but coal became standard. The boilers and engines sat either in the midsection of the boat or at the back, the boat's stern. Hence the name side wheeler or stern wheeler. References to the paddle wheels which turned and pushed the boats through the water. In 1819, the first steamboat attempted to go up the Great Canal River. Uh, it encountered a problem, which had been a problem for all the boats on the river, and this was at Red House Shoal, which was a small ripple or a fall in the river. Well, when the first steamboat attempted to go up the river, it could not best the falls at Red House. But the next year, another boat tried it, got up through the shoals, and went on up to the upper of Canal River. With the arrival of the steamboat, it became important to further improve the canal to enhance navigation. Shoals made it difficult for boats to pass through, and Red House Shoal and Johnson's Scary Creek Shoals were the worst, although there were 10 shoals altogether. The Virginia General Assembly appropriated funds to cut chutes or channels through the shoals, build wing dams, and remove snags, making the river easier to navigate. Soon, many steamboats plied the waters of the canal. The steamboat dramatically hastened the development of America. Steamboats carried people, freight, and commodities up and down the Mississippi, Ohio, Canal, and other rivers, which fed this great drainage basin in the center of the country. This commercial development provided markets for salt, coal, agricultural, and other products which were produced in the Canal Valley. The first steamboats were built to carry cargo, but some designs were modified to carry passengers too. These were called packet boats. The packet boat is a boat that carried packages, light freight, and passengers. Now, the packet boats were unique in that uh, as they began to evolve, they were elaborated on by how they were built and the services they provided. And they would carry passengers overnight, they would provide him with as fine a food as they could find. They were decorated inside with the very finest of brass, chandeliers, silverware, linen napkins. But the boat owners knew this was the way to get passengers and get patronage. Packet boat travel remained popular for decades. It was a leisurely way to travel throughout the region. Packet boats not only made stops at towns along the river, but also at farms along the way all of which had a steamboat landing. Packet boats served the needs of those who lived along the river, and the role of the packet boat captain was greater than just piloting his craft. During the day, they would wave a handkerchief to get his attention and have him land, or at night, they would wave a lantern. And there were personal relationships developed between these patrons on the shore and the boat owners on a personal basis. They would carry things as small as a spool of thread for a lady, or as big as the cow and the bull that we, the farmer was shipping to market. The Great Canal River and Pittsburgh was one of the major routes because it wasn't that far to come down to Point Pleasant, turn north, and carry on trades going past Wheeling, uh, Parkersburg, on up to Pittsburgh, and back down. So this became a major commercial route as well. Then you go downstream, and primarily there were Great Canal River and Cincinnati packet lines that carried on trades between, of course, the Great Canal River and downstream. You get to places like Portsmouth, Huntington, uh, Ironton, on down to Maysville, and on down to Cincinnati. There were still need to ship bulk commodities on the river. And to do this, the towboat evolved. Now, the towboat didn't carry passengers at all. It didn't carry any light freight, but it was strictly a utilitarian boat that pushed large fleets of barges. Initially, wooden barges were built, and they carried salt, sand, coal, other bulk commodities along the river. They were very, very effective. As a matter of fact, they're the forefathers of today's modern towboats, which do virtually the same thing. You begin to see steam ferry boats to carry people from one shore to the other before the era of bridge building. You begin to see showboats, floating theaters being towed by boats, 
carrying on entertainment from town to town along the river valleys. The Great Canal River was a very popular showboat river. Showboats were a fixture on the canal for over a century. They would begin touring in April and present their programs throughout the warm months. They put on dramas, musicals, comedies, and the like, and they drew hearty audiences. The Calliope was a fixture on a showboat, and this large steam-powered organ would announce the arrival of the boat and its actors. The steamboat became the transportation backbone of the Kanawha Valley because it carried goods and passengers cost-effectively, and it opened and serviced faraway markets. In 1846, the salt industry, which had expanded to include furnaces along what is present-day Kanawha City, produced an all-time high of over 3.2 million bushels, using mostly slave labor. By 1850, it began a long decline because new salt sources were developed nearer their markets. The meatpacking industry, which grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, was now centered in Chicago, Illinois. Coal output increased to satisfy the ever-growing energy needs of a young nation, and steam towboats were the workhorses that carried the resource to Western markets. Charleston became the major city along the Great Canal, although numerous smaller communities developed throughout the valley. Point Pleasant became a riverboat center where generations of river families worked as boat builders or in river transportation. A section of the Canal River at Point Pleasant became a safe haven, a place where ship owners could winter their boats, keeping them free from dangerous ice flows, which sometimes disrupted the Ohio. During the Civil War, the Great Canal was strategically important to both the South and the North. Sentiment in the Canal Valley favored the South, although the North controlled the area during the war, except for a brief period in 1862. After the war, railroads made their way into the Canal Valley, and spurs to the main lines opened more of the mountainous terrain to timbering and coal mining. There was an ever-growing coal industry within the valley, and coal had become the fuel that was to help create an industrial America. So the transportation of coal was very important. Railroads with their steam-powered locomotives became real competitors to the steamboats that plied the canal, even though the costs to ship by boat were less than by railroad. Railroads did not have to rely upon adequate water level in the canal to transport their goods. For example, on average, only 136 days of the year were available for shipping coal by steamboat from the Charleston area due to river conditions. In 1878, a significant effort was begun by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to increase the depth of the Great Canal by creating a series of 11 locks and dams at strategic points along the river. Dams raised the level of the river, and locks provided a means to transfer a boat from one water level to the next in stair-step fashion. The river man were uh, most um, insistent that the river be improved, but they didn't want dams uh, because when the river was high, they could float anything uh, right over the top of the dams. Uh, so the French uh, movable system really uh, fit the uh, situation very nicely. Uh, these were large um, planks, if you like, as much as 14 feet high, four feet wide, and they were propped up against a uh, masonry or concrete uh, dam uh, to hold the water back, but they had props that they could kick out and drop these wickets, and you had a free-flowing river. The principle there was that if they could raise and lower these dams, when they were needed during the summer months, they would be up and create the pools where they could go behind them and use them for navigation. But during the spring when there was high water and during the fall when there's water and winter, they could lower the dams and the river had natural river flow. This was the principle behind the movable dam. And of course, when it was up, they had to use the lock and the lock chambers were built of various sizes depending on where they were built. And to do this, they tried to create a system of these and they really became what I refer to as the stair steps on the river because you went from one level to the next and each time you create a pool behind it and then you went to the next level and created another pool. It was a 20-year effort with 10 locks and dams being built and their construction dramatically enhanced navigability of the river. 
It marked the first time that the canal could be negotiated year-round, except for periods of extreme drought or major flooding. It worked very well on the Great Canal River. As a matter of fact, the, the Great Canal has the distinction of having two of the very first movable dams built on a major river in America. And later, when completed, the 10 locks and dams on the Great Canal River, the first series, were uh, created a situation where the Great Canal was the first river in America to have a series of locks and dams, movable dams on its river. So they had two firsts there. Other innovation could be found on the Great Canal. Ward Engineering Works, headed by Charles Ward, began full-time operation in Charleston in 1880. Over a span of five decades, the company built a number of highly regarded shallow draft boats and boat components, many with innovations that changed the industry. He was one of the innovators in the steam propulsion from the standpoint of powering propellers, not stern wheels. He was inventive in how he built boats, metal boats as opposed to the wooden boats and associated with that. But one of the things he did was he found out how to increase the power of his boilers and his engines to create a better, more efficient vessel. He built a little boat called the James Rumsey, and it was a very small boat compared to the bigger tow boats of the day. When you compare it to size and operation of one of the bigger sternwheel tow boats, the heavy boats that were operating on the river then towing coal, it looked like a miniature. It was propeller driven, steam powered. It was built in such a way as to reduce manpower use on the boat. It was a much more efficient boat but it was also a very powerful little boat. And it had been sort of made fun of by a number of boat owners along the river when they saw it being built. So he challenged the DT Lane, which was at that time uh, the cock of the walk as far as the big towboats on the Great Canal. And they accepted the challenge. Well, when the pushing contest happened, little James Rumsey ended up beating the DT Lane, both pushing it upstream and pushing it downstream. He was an innovator also in doing the dual propellers on boats and the diesel-powered or uh, petroleum-powered boats. So his approach to things was that he could better what was being done in a way to make it more efficient throughout. Charles Ward died in January 1915, but the company continued for several years under the leadership of his son. He got very discouraged with labor problems and threatened to just throw up the whole thing and do something else, and Ward Engineering sort of disappeared. 